This is my first visit to Trinity, uh, which I first became familiar with when I was a sophomore at Emmaus Bible College, which isn't too far away on the border of Iowa and Illinois. Uh, and I first uh, encountered this reading the Trinity Journal. And uh, so it's, and then uh, since then, of course, I've come to know um, many of the great thinkers and theologians that have been based here at Trinity. So it's really an honor, Tom. Thanks so much for the opportunity to be here and uh, to spend a day with you and think together about some of these uh, dynamics. I know it sounds a little bit like a honeymoon pitch. Liturgy is for lovers. This is what you should do uh, on your honeymoon, um, which, of course, you should uh, worship on your honeymoon. But um, the themes, actually, that I want to tackle are agency, action, and Christian worship. As we approach Reformation Day, we do well to remember that the Reformers were not just invested in doctrinal renewal. They were also deeply concerned with liturgical renewal. They were just as attentive to the ordo of worship as they were the ordo salutis. Indeed, they were concerned about the order of worship because they were concerned with the biblical understanding of the order of salvation. John Calvin, for example, not only outlined the errors of distorted medieval soteriology, he, he was equally insightful about what my friend John Whitfleet calls the liturgical sins of the late medieval church. And Calvin saw the connection between those two as more than coincidental. This is why the Reformation was not just an intellectual project of dotting our homartiological I's and crossing our soteriological T's. The Reformers sought the renewal of congregational life as it centered in worship around word and table, such that the practices of Christian worship and the practices of the gathered people of God reflected the same gospel of grace in which the triune God is the initiating actor. If that is true in our salvation, it should also be true in our worship. Otherwise, it could be the case that we are Calvinists in our soteriology while being functional Pelagians in our worship, in which case our worship will actually foster religious orientations that run counter to Scripture. And yet, for all the new energy around a resurgent Calvinism, I've not observed the same sort of concern for or investment in liturgical reform. That's not to say there aren't incredibly encouraging signs of newfound concern with liturgical theology in the vicinity and ballpark of those conversations, Nevertheless, there are also many who enthusiastically identify as Reformed who have uncritically inherited and maintained worship practices that I think are inconsistent with their theology. My lecture today is an invitation to expand the scope of reform by recovering the Reformer's own concern with worship renewal and with liturgical form. So I want to begin by thinking through these dynamics of agency and action in terms of the reformation of worship. Now, I recognize that for some of us, liturgy is going to sound like a bad word. It's loaded with connotations that make us suspicious. It sounds like vain repetition, the dread religion that is an expression of human effort. In short, we might react to liturgy as if the very notion is bound up with salvation by works, salvation by some kind of ritual observance. What's interesting is that the Reformers had exactly those kinds of reservations about medieval Roman Catholic worship. But their response was not to be anti-liturgical, but rather to be properly liturgical. The problem wasn't liturgy per se, it was disordered liturgies. In particular, the reformers were critical of worship practices that had been effectively naturalized, we might say. Forms of worship that construed liturgical practices as these kind of imminent operations of human accomplishment. I think this is a temptation of any liturgical theology that takes the body seriously. 
There's going to be a temptation to naturalize the liturgy, liturgy as if it were just an embodied practice like any other. As if the formation of disciples in Christian worship operates in pretty much the same way as the formation of Manny Ramirez as an excellent hitter, hitter through bodily rituals of batting practice. And this temptation to sort of naturalize worship, if you take bodily rhythms and rituals seriously, I'm, I'm actually... I'm, I might be pointing out with one finger, but I'm pointing back with three more. So this is, I recognize this as a temptation that, that attends my own project. While worship is entirely embodied, it is not only material. And though worship is wholly natural, it is never only natural. Christian worship is nothing less than an invitation to participate in the life of the triune God. In short, the centrality of embodiment should not be understood as a naturalizing of worship that would deny the dynamic presence of the Spirit. To the contrary, the Spirit meets, nourishes, transforms, and empowers us through and in such material practices. The church's worship, you could say, is a uniquely intense sight of the Spirit's transformative presence. We must never lose sight of the charged nature of these practices. These are not just rituals that are unique because they are aimed at a different telos, for example. They are also unique because they are practices that bring us face to face with the living God. If in what follows today I focus on the formative power of Christian worship, we do well to remember that in a sense even this even that formative aspect, which is what I want to explore with you today, even that is itself a byproduct, in a sense, of the more fundamental aim of worship, which is praise and adoration of the triune God. As Marva Don once articulated, it is God who is both the subject and object of our worship. The whole point, she says, of liturgical lines and rituals is to create a powerful environment of God-centeredness. Worship is not for me. It's not primarily meant to be an experience that meets my felt needs, nor should we merely reduce it to a pedagogy of desire. That would be just one more construal, sophisticated construal of worship as for me. Rather, worship is about and for God. To say that God is both subject and object is to emphasize that the triune God is both the audience and agent of our worship. It is to and for God, and God is active in the word and sacraments. This is where the reformers' sense of liturgical reform has contemporary relevance. As Nicholas Wolterstorff has pointed out, the medieval Western liturgy, against which the reformers were reacting, so the, the sort of accrued liturgy in late medieval and early modern uh, um, Christendom, that medieval Western liturgy was beset by its own kind of naturalization insofar, he says, as it was a liturgy in which to an extraordinary degree the action of God was lost from view. The action of God was lost from view. The actions were all human, he says. The priest addressed God. The priest brought about Christ's bodily but static presence. But God as agent is nowhere in view. Thus, this sort of sacramentalism, which let's not confuse with sacramentalism per se, but that sort of sacramentalism is a sacramentalism, Wolterstorff says, of God's static presence rather than one of God's active doing. And if there was any concern with action, it was focused on the so-called work of the people, the upward acts of expression and ritual observance, which, ironically, then were only really carried out by the presider. So contrast that, then, with uh, uh, um, uh, the reformer's view. In contrast, it's an emphasis on action, and particularly God's action in worship, that Wolterstorff distills as what he calls the genius of Reformed worship. The liturgy, as the Reformers understood it, he says, and practiced it, consists of God acting 
and us responding through the work of the Spirit. Listen, he puts it this way once. Indulge me one quote, long quotation from Nick Wolterstorff. The Reformers saw the liturgy as God's action and our faithful reception of that action. The governing idea of the Reformed liturgy is thus twofold. The conviction that to participate in the liturgy is to enter the sphere of God's acting, not just of God's presence, plus the conviction that we are to appropriate God's action in faith and gratitude through the work of the Spirit. The liturgy is a meeting between God and God's people, a meeting in which both parties act, but in which God initiates and we respond. For example, John Calvin would emphasize that the sacraments are not strictly the works of men, but of God. In baptism of the Lord's Supper, he says, we do nothing. We simply come to God to receive his grace. Baptism from our side from our side, is a passive work. We bring nothing to it but faith, which has all things laid up in Christ. The Reformed liturgical theologian Hughes Oliphant Old has well captured this when he argues, quote, what Calvin has in mind is that God is active in our worship. When we worship God according to his word, he is at work in the worship of the church. For Calvin, the worship of the church is a matter of divine activity rather than human creativity. So worship is a site of God's action, not just God's presence. The emphasis, in accordance with Calvin's theology of grace, is on the primacy of God's gracious initiation. God is the first and primary actor in worship. But the the point isn't passivity, turning us into a mere audience, spectators of what someone else is doing. That was the problem of medieval worship. Instead, this emphasis on God's action in worship includes a picture of what we could call graced interaction between God and his people, a liturgical form of call and response, grace and gratitude. Wolterstorff sees this highlighted in the liturgical theology of a later Calvinist, the Dutch theologian Abraham Kuyper. You didn't think somebody was coming here from Calvin College and not citing Abraham Kuyper, right? (laughs) But here now, this is the Kuyper of Kuyper, the liturgical theologian. Commenting on Kuyper's proposals for liturgical reform, Walter observes that for Kuyper, Various parts of the liturgy and the liturgy as a whole are to be seen as, quote, an interaction between God and the congregation. Liturgy is action. And the actions are not just human actions and not just divine actions, but an interaction between God and his people in which the congregation self-consciously participates. But this shouldn't be confused with a liturgical semi-Pelagianism Precisely because the interaction, even the interaction, is made possible by the Trinitarian operations of grace. Worship is, as Philip Buton puts it, a Trinitarian enactment in which, quote, the initiatory downward movement of Christian worship begins in the Father's gracious and free revelation of the divine nature to the church through the Son by means of the Spirit. The upward movement of human response in worship is also fundamentally motivated by God. Human response, the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, arises from the faith that has its source in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. For the Reformers and the Reformed, even our expression of gratitude is made possible by the gracious work of the Spirit. This is a liturgical theology that expresses the mystery and good news of Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 10. So let's return from the Reformation to our contemporary context. Might these Reformed insights about liturgical renewal be relevant today? Do we need another Reformation of our worship? Has contemporary Protestant evangelical worship ended up, ironically, mimicking precisely the scripted naturalism and spectatorish passivity that occasioned the Protestant Reformation. 
In what ways do our current paradigms of contemporary worship effectively make us the only actors in worship? Not only failing to appreciate the primacy of God's action, but failing to see God as active in our worship. Have we not fallen prey once again to that static medieval paradigm that is focused on presence? And what you would need to do is undertake an analysis of a worship context. You need, sometimes being good theologians means being good ethnographers, uh, it, which, which sometimes makes it hard to be good worshipers, but you could take a Sunday off one time, okay? And, and you sort of have to analyze what are the rhythms and language and forms and scripts of a worshiping community and how many of our sort of contemporary paradigms are fixated on, on exactly that dynamic of presence, Rather than the, which is this, which according to Wolterstorff's analysis is this more static paradigm, which in an odd way breeds passivity and spectatorness in us, as opposed to forms of worship that are participatory and that focus on God's action. I did a little exercise uh, with my daughter who's 17 in church one Sunday. So we come from a, a member of the Christian Reformed Church and we are hymnal people, Psalter hymnal people. We still have books in the back of the pews. We, we open them up. But every once in a while, somebody sort of goes rogue, and they, we sing a song that's not in the hymnal. And they have to print it in the bulletin. And sometimes those songs are great. Sometimes they're not so great. And so one, after one of these uh, songs, I sat down with my daughter, and I said, we're going to do a little grammatical analysis of this chorus, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Welcome to my house. Um, and the point was, I'm, I want us to start thinking about the form of our worship, and that includes even thinking about the grammar of what we sing. And so I said, we are going to use a circle, and we're going to circle every instance in this song in which God is the subject, that is, God is the actor or the focus. And then we're going to use a square to square out all of the times that I'm singing about myself. Who do you think won in that analysis? And what I want us to see is that unconsciously there is something being said about what worship is for in the form of what we are singing. So I want to turn then with that sort of reformation frame and interest to think about expression and formation as two different dynamics and emphases in Christian worship. I want to suggest what might at first seem to be a counterintuitive correlation. I would propose that just to the extent we recover a biblical sense of the primacy of God's action in worship, we will also recover an attentive appreciation to the form of worship. Okay, so my hypothesis is, the more that you are invested in, attentive to, and concerned about understanding God as the primary actor in worship, you will actually be more attentive to the form of your worship. I say this might be counterintuitive because I think we probably associate liturgical formalism with just the sort of Pelagian ritualism that the reformers were calling into question. But in the remainder of this talk, I want to argue for the opposite, that it is precisely because we have a deep sense of God's Trinitarian agency and action in worship that we need to be attentive to and intentional about the form of our worship, and particularly how the Spirit gifts us with forms of worship that meet us as the embodied creatures that we are. Historic Christian faith has always intuited this even if our forebears didn't have cognitive science and social psychology at their disposal. What they did have was a robust theology of creation, an appreciation for the implications of the incarnation, and a sacramental ontology that saw the charged nature of matter that participated in God. The historic practices of Christian paideia, Christian education, Christian formation what Matthew Myers Bolton has called the church's ancient disciplinary treasury. And he's actually getting that from John Calvin. This is, I always plug this book wherever I am. Matthew Myers Bolton, Life in God. 
is a study of John Calvin's practical theology in which Bolton documents the extent to which Calvin was invested in actually not the demolishing of a monastic project, but the expansion of a monastic project. Here's, here's what I find fascinating about it. We know, of course, that the reformers undid the monasteries. They actually destroyed the monasteries. But it wasn't because of opposition, in, Calvin, in John Calvin's case, it wasn't because of opposition to the kind of disciplinary rituals and rhythms and spiritual disciplines that were taking place there. What he, what he rejected was the sequestering of those only in the monastery. For Calvin, to break down the walls of the monastery is to make all of Geneva a magnum monasterium where the rhythms of everyone's day are governed by these, the, what, what he calls the church's ancient disciplinary treasury. So uh, um, if, if at various times you start worrying that I sound Catholic, Roman Catholic, I just want to point out there's nothing I'm saying that John Calvin didn't say. Okay. Well, there might be a couple things, but anyway. We'll... <laughs> so the historic practices of Christian paideia, Christian formation, have always been a full-bodied, holistic set of disciplines that not only informed the intellect, but reformed the very know-how by which we feel our way around the world, reaching the incarnate significance that Maurice Merleau-Ponty simply called perception. Indeed, Christian liturgical formation has long understood what a French theorist like Pierre Bourdieu finally names, that pedagogies can extort the essential from the seemingly insignificant. So, for example, Christian worship and spiritual formation have long known and affirmed in practice that gestures are not just something that we do, they do something to us. That kneeling for confession, for example, is a kind of cosmological act that inscribes in us a comportment to God and neighbor, a way of being in the world that sinks into our bones and becomes sedimented in the core of our being through the crackle of our old knees. The postures of our bodies spill out beyond the sanctuary then and become postures of existential comportment to the world. Christian worship has long appreciated the magnitude of practices that marshal the mundane, Bread, wine, water. To enact and stage kingdom come week after week, giving us a tactile opportunity to rehearse the consummation of time and thus go into the meantime of our not yet with a different background, a different horizon of perception, inhabiting this not yet as the fields of the Lord that call for both work and play as the story of God's redeeming love sinks down into our imaginative background through practices that are even, we could say, kinesthetic, we then learn to perceive the world differently and thus constitute our environment as God's good but broken creation. What before would have been vague rumblings and distracting background noises will now, as our imaginations are formed, begin to crystallize into something different. The cries of the oppressed, the silences of the marginalized alien, Rachel weeping for her children. What was previously perceived with the bright, shiny sheen of success, comfort, insularity, accumulation, security, now we will be learning to perceive anew because it will be constituted within a very different horizon, from a different background. Conversely, what might have been perceived previously as problems are now actually callings. We learn to constitute our world differently. Christian liturgical practices and spiritual disciplines are not just means of personal renewal. They, in a sense, remake the world because they transform the perception of the people of God who not only inhabit the world differently, but in a sense inhabit a different world. We learn how to inhabit this as God's creation. As I've emphasized elsewhere, Christian worship does this on an aesthetic register. I'm not, ta- I'm not saying because it's pretty or because it's beautiful. I'm saying because it's tactile and kinesthetic. The sanctification of perception 
is a renewal and restoring or restoring of our imagination, which means that worship is more art than science, more on the order of a poem than a PowerPoint distillation of the data. However, the transformative possibilities afforded by Christian worship, in other words, I'm, I'm trying to suggest that Christian worship has, a, has the form that it does and has a kind of tactile kinesthetic shape to it because that's what trains us to imagine the world anew in light of the gospel. And, and uh, um, that transformation of our imagination, that shaping of our perception, those possibilities afforded by Christian worship practices, however, are not true of all that describes itself as worship. In other words, I don't think that all self-described Christian worship will afford the sanctification of perception that I've just described. And here, I need to raise a critical and perhaps uncomfortable point. Form matters. Form matters. Not because of any traditionalism or some conservative preservation of the status quo, but precisely because there is a logic to the practice that is unarticulated, but nonetheless has a coherent sense about it. Form matters in worship because it is the form of worship that tells the story, that, or better, that enacts the story, we could say. Maybe I should pause and say, when I'm saying the form of worship, I don't want you to think about style. So I'm going to talk about a narrative shape and form to the, a service of Christian worship. I'm not talking about pianos versus banjos. I'm not talking pipe organs versus mandolin. That's, I'm not talking about style. I'm talking about the pieces that make up the gathering of the people of God in the congregational practice of worship. Wide swaths of contemporary Christianity have bought into a specious form-content distinction. We have assumed that Christianity is primarily a message and thus defined by a content that is distillable from historical forms. Along with this distinction comes the assumption that forms are basically just neutral containers for that message, selected on the basis of taste, preference, or cultural relevance. With that distinction in place then, both a form content distinction and an assumption that form is really just neutral, it's ba you, the decisions you make about form are more simply contextual, with that distinction in place, we then treat the historical received forms of Christian worship as a kind of disposable husk that can be shucked and chucked as long as we keep the kernel of the gospel message. When this distinction and attitude are wedded to our late modern penchant for novelty, we, bring to, uh, we begin to approach Christian worship as an event for disseminating the message and thus look for forms that will be fresh, attractive, relevant, accessible. I'm trying not to say those things with a sneer. Okay? I'm, uh, uh, really, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm trying to understand the dynamics of how our liturgical innovations happen. In fact, since it, it is, it's in this content or the message, since it's the message that matters, and since, according to this model, forms are just neutral containers for the message, we might actually adopt forms that are more familiar and less strange for contemporary audiences. By the way, do you notice, as soon as you start describing your congregation as an audience, you've actually already made a decision about who is acting in worship and in the gathered congregation. So, for example, uh, um, if, if you work with this form content distinction and then you think the gospel is this distillable content, that is the message, and which is in a way portable to, to whatever form will work to get the message out, then what will happen is you will say, well, let's distill the gospel message, but let's look for forms, containers, that are more 
attractive, more accessible, more relevant, more uh, au courant. Because nobody likes going to boring, old, stodgy church services, but people really like going to malls, or people really like going to the coffee shop, or people really like going to rave concerts, apparently. Uh, um, so, so what you do is you distill the gospel message, because now you've got the message, and that's the gospel, and the containers are neutral, and so we deposit the gospel into the mall container, or we deposit the gospel into the coffee shop container. In doing so, we believe that we have, in a sense, sanctified these forms, taking them up in the service to the gospel. But such strategies, I would suggest, are actually very intellectualist. They reduce the gospel to a propositional message, and because of that, they completely miss the formative power of the forms themselves. Because such relevant paradigms are unwittingly intellectualist, they fail to appreciate that we are liturgical animals shaped by the practices that work on our unconscious. And so they also fail to appreciate that, in fact, these forms are not neutral. The forms of the mall or coffee shop are not just benign containers that, carry, that can carry any content. These forms are already aimed and loaded at a particular vision of the good life. They carry their own teleological orientation and come loaded with a complex of rituals and practices that carry a vision of the good life. So, while we might think reconfiguring worship to feel like a mall is a way of making Jesus relevant and accessible, in fact, we are unwittingly teaching worshipers and seekers to treat Jesus like any other commodity that they encounter in the mall. The point isn't, my point isn't that both form and content matter. My point, I think, is a little more radical than that. In some significant sense, we need to askew the form-content distinction. Because worship is not just the dissemination of a content or the expression of an inner feeling. The very form of worship tells the story. The form of worship is the logic of the practice, and as such, it has a coherence that is fundamentally narrative, not deductive. The narrative arc of Christian worship is how it makes sense, and it is through our immersion in the implicit narrative logic of that practice that we acquire a kind of what, what Bourdieu calls a practical sense of the Christian story. It soaks into our imagination and becomes part of our constituting background. It starts to become the story that governs how we experience the world. To be immersed in the irreducible practical logic of Christian worship is like carrying Mark Twain's cat. There's this great quip from Mark Twain where he says, he who carries a cat by the tail learn something he could learn in no other way. <laughs> he who carries a cat by the tail learns something he could learn in no other way. If, imagine I've carried a cat by the tail, which I have not. But imagine I have carried a cat by the tail. That experience is irreducible. I could try to explain to you the experience of carrying a cat by the tail, but you would never get it the same way as trying to carry a cat by the tail. I'm suggesting that the formative power of Christian worship works exactly the same way. We thereby learn something we can learn in no other way. There is something irreducible in the know-how that is carried in the practices of Christian worship. Why? Because that narrative form of Christian worship, of historic Christian worship, tells the story in ways that operate even under the radar of our intellectual apprehension. This is just a way of saying that with liturgy, like poetry, we should be aware of what Cleanth Brooks called the heresy of paraphrase. The heresy of, we love hunting out heresies, so this has got to be good, right? The heresy of paraphrase, if, if I can summarize it uh, um, easily. In poetry criticism, 
The heresy of paraphrase means this. The meaning of a poem is irreducibly bound up with the form of the poem. So poems have line breaks, there's cadences, there's meter, there's sometimes rhyme. And the meaning of that poem is inextricably bound up with the form of that poem. As a critic, I could come along and in paragraph propositional form summarize much of what the poem says. I could give you a summary. I could give you an analysis and an exegesis. That would never be equivalent to the meaning of the poem because poetry means in its form. It's bound up and inextricably linked with its form. So there's a surely apocryphal tale, but a great, those are always the best ones, in which uh, T.S. Eliot gave a reading of The Wasteland. And upon conclusion, someone in the audience had the temerity to ask him, Mr. Eliot, what does it mean? To which Eliot's response was, to reread The Wasteland. <laughs> because you don't ask a poet to now explain prosaically what his creation means because its meaning is inextricably bound up with the form of the poem. The point is that the meaning of the poem is not some distillable content or idea or message that can be neatly paraphrased and summarized in prose form. What the poem means is bound up with how the poem means. Its meaning is intertwined with all of the metaphorical play and resonance that can never quite be named or identified, and yet are precisely those elements that do so much literary work. The poem means in its cadence and meter, its diction and wordplay, its pauses and line breaks. The meaning of a poem is playing a different game. It means differently. Um, I'm suggesting that the same is true with respect to the meaning of Christian worship. The logic of the practice cannot be paraphrased because there is an imaginative coherence that is undistillable and yet irreducibly significant. We get the story in the form of worship that intentionally rehearses the unfolding of our covenantal relationship to a promise-keeping God, centered in the climax of the covenant in Jesus. While it has been intentionally and communally crafted over time, the logic of historic Christian worship also means on a register that exceeds and eludes our conscious appropriation which is precisely why worship isn't just something that we do, it does something to us. The practices of Christian worship mean in this narrative mode. So, for example, in, in, in sort of standard uh, uh, Reformed worship, which is also, by the way, turns out to be standard Western, small-c Catholic worship, there is... There is a story that is told in what we do in the moments so that worship always begins with a call to worship which comes from the gracious God who is the initiator and caller and elector that has brought us here in the first place. It doesn't, we don't just stand up and say, all right, everyone find a seat. It's a call that echoes creation itself. It's our recreation in the call to worship. And then as you follow the sort of narrative logic of the order of worship, very soon you know that in Reformed worship you have to come to grips with your sin because you've just been called into the presence of a holy God. And this is why in the narrative logic of Reformed worship, really early on, we communally and collectively confess our sins. There's no way that this story can go on when we haven't done that in God's presence. In his holy presence, this has to happen. He's called us there. Now we confess our sin. But that story has to continue with the logic of the immediate and gracious announcement of our pardon, the good news, the, the assurance of salvation. And so what I'm suggesting is that there is, in a way, if you just kind of looked at the bulletin, in good historic Christian worship, you can read a story in the chapters of what we do together as a congregation. And there is a logic to that, which is narratival. It makes sense in the story, and it makes sense because it's reenacting 
the story. This is how Christian worship works on both a macro and a micro level. On a macro level, the overall narrative arc of Christian worship, gathering, confessing, listening, submitting, communing, sending, tells a story in the background by its very structure and organization. There is a rhythm and cadence that becomes part of our own background, such that this story governs our perception of the world in ways we don't realize. I mean, the wager here is that you are actually learning what it means to be forgiven simply by moving through this story with the people of God week in and week out. And as a process, you are also learning on a kind of gut level what it means to forgive. You are becoming that kind of person. In this way, Christian faith is something that we come to believe with our body, you might say. It's incorporated into us as we are incorporated into the body politic that is the body of Christ. We absorb Christian faith as a kind of practical sense, not primarily or only by the didactic dissemination of content, heresy, but rather through our immersion in an ethos and an environment where the story is in the air we breathe and in the water in which we swim, operative in the background in ways we might not realize. There's a, there's a kind of grand poetry about the shape of intentional, historic Christian worship that shows rather than just tells. And such a narrative showing resonates with our imagination in ways that elude our intellectual grasp. If worship is, what, what we're saying is, worship is not just an expressive act of our upward, sincere expression of praise and devotion to God. It is actually a downward move in which God is acting to mold us and make us and shape us. And if that's the case, I don't know if I should turn off the mic, but if that's the case, then actually, this is just so we have something to talk about. There, there can even be a virtue to going through the motions. There can be a virtue, not always, but there can be a virtue to being committed to being part of the people of God who go through the motions because you know who's acting even when you are going through the motions is the Spirit of God. There's a kind of formative power that is at work there that is not dependent on how you are feeling that day or how much you're into it. And I say as a parent of four teenagers, or now a 21-year-old and three teenagers, a lot is at stake in how we think about the faith formation of young people on, uh, based on the decisions we make about that point. Okay? This is all, I, I hope we can talk about that afterwards. This is also why the form of worship works on us at a micro level as well. If historic Christian worship and the ancient spiritual disciplines carry the story that seeps into our social imaginary, this is in no small part because liturgical practices are also intentionally aesthetic and they tap into our imaginative core. It's no accident that the poetry of the Psalms has long constituted the church's prayer book. Nor is it mere coincidence that the worship of the people of God has been marked by singing. In these and countless other ways, the inherited treasury of formative disciplines has been characterized by an allusivity and metaphorosity that means more than we can say. There is a reason to our rhymes. There is a logic carried in the meter of our hymns and the shape of our gestures. Worship innovations that are inattentive to this, may end up adopting forms that forfeit precisely those aspects of worship that sanctify our perception. Hence, wise worship planning and leadership is not only discerning about content, the lyrics of songs, the content of a pastoral prayer, the message of a sermon, Wise, intentional worship leadership should also be discerning about the kinesthetic meaning of the form of our worship. We will be concerned not only with the what, but the how. Because Christian faith is not only a knowing that, it's also a kind of know-how. It's a practical sense. Because meter and tune 
each means in its own irreducible way, for example, the form of our songs is as important as the content. It's in this sense that to sing is to pray twice. Worship wisdom requires that we be attentive to the practical sense of aesthetic forms, lest we end up singing lyrics that confess Jesus as Lord, accompanied by a tune that means something very, very different. Similarly, because our words mean more than their propositional content, and because worship is intended to not only inform the intellect but recruit the imagination, we will want to be attentive to the poetic and metaphorical power of words to evoke the world to come, thus resisting temptations to flatten our worship words to the utilitarian pragmatism of the marketplace. If I can make a plug here for my colleague, I think Neil Planinga is coming to visit you soon at the Henry Center. His new book called Reading for Preaching is a whole book on that sentence. That is that one of the best things that pastors and preachers and worship leaders can do for the sake of fostering the people of God and fostering worship is to become people who are shaped by fiction, literature, poetry, and good writing. To learn the power of this play of metaphor. In these and countless other ways, we, we could spend time talking about gesture, architecture, images, icons, color, vestments, more. In all these ways, Christian worship is more than its content. Doesn't mean it's less than its content, so don't anybody come and ask me that afterwards, but Christian worship is also more than its content, and it always means more than it says. Worship that, attends, that intends to be formative, and more specifically, worship that intends to foster an encounter with God that transforms our imagination has to be attentive to, attentive to and intentional about these aesthetics of human understanding. Christian worship needs to be an incubator for the imagination, inviting us into the real world by bringing us aesthetic olive leaves from the kingdom that is coming helping us to then envision what it would look like for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We will absorb this eschatological vision of shalom in ways that elude our awareness, and the story will be incorporated into our bodies on this aesthetic register. So the whole of Christian worship needs to embody this guiding story in multivalent ways, Christian worship should send us, not only, send us out not only with new knowledge and information, but with a renewed feel for the world. In conclusion, my hope is that a renewed interest in the Reformation and Reformed theology will be equally attentive to the liturgical heritage of the Reformers, which is a tangible point of intersection where Reformed theology meets congregational life. Indeed, if worship is primarily a space of God's action, which re then requires that we be attentive to the form of worship, I think we could highlight two concrete opportunities for renewal in our congregations. First, we need a new intentionality about the design and shape of worship in which we eschew the cult of novelty and instead appreciate the accrued wisdom in the inheritance of historic forms of worship. I don't, here's, here's um, in other words, um, everybody go back and read Robert Weber. Because the future is ancient. And one of the best things, that, this isn't about what's the next best thing in Christian worship. It's actually about remembering ancient wisdom that has nourishment for the people of God living in a post-Christian context. And so uh, um, if, if there's any sort of outcome to this, it should be an encouragement to remember a new ancient wisdom. Second, on a practical level, I think this should yield a renewed commitment to what my colleague John Whitfleet calls liturgical catechesis. Recognizing that gathered Christian worship is actually at the heart of discipleship. Because that's the case, at the heart of Christian formation should be a kind of liturgical education that helps both young and old, and old understand why we do what we do when we worship. 
For example, my, so my children uh, um, are formed in, in uh, uh, catechism by going through the Heidelberg Catechism, which is our tradition's teaching tool, our catechesis. And what's interesting is that the Heidelberg Catechism is sort of organized around the Apostles' Creed, the Ten Commandments, and the Lord's Prayer. Why is that? Because that's what the church would have done Sunday after Sunday after Sunday gathered in worship. So we, we might come to something like the Heidelberg Catechism now and feel like it's just this sort of didactic, abstract structure. Makes sense. Yeah, those all seem like good things. Apostles' Creed, uh, uh, um, Ten Commandments, uh, uh, um, Lord's Prayer. Wow. Um, but in fact, for, for those historically who would have been going through the catechism, this was to go through and learn what we do when we worship in the gathered congregation week by week. In a wonderful study of the continued development and maturation of Calvin's catechism for children, this, Calvin was interested in children's ministry. Don't tell me you're a Calvinist if you don't care about children's ministry. He spent his whole life working on a catechism for children. And Randall Zachman, in his wonderful book, John Calvin as Teacher, Pastor, and Theologian, tracks the development of that catechism in all of its different editions across his life. And he notes that the final version of the catechism culminates with a focus on worship. Gone, in fact, are narrow fixations on election and predestination. Those are nowhere in the last edition of Calvin's Children's Catechism. Instead, Zachman points out, the overall direction of the line of questioning pursued by the minister in the catechism is to see if the child knows why she worships God the way she does. When our worship itself bears the narrative form of the gospel, to understand what we do when we worship is, in fact, to understand what God has done and is doing for us. It is, in fact, to understand the good news. Thanks very much.